For 35 years, Doss and Bertie Winkel have traveled the globe, driven by a passion to photograph wildlife and local cultures. Joining them on this journey is daughter Femke, an apprentice with a keen eye and an eagerness to learn the tricks of the trade. They're facing perhaps their most challenging assignment to date. To capture on film the rugged beauty and breathtaking contrasts of one of the most spectacular countries on earth, Peru. Peru has an enormous diversity. It has lots of habitats, it has lots of ecosystems, and it's a paradise for a photographer. And this is actually the reason why it has been on top of my list for years. For the next eight weeks, they'll travel the length and breadth of Peru, exploring its remotest corners. From the rugged desert paradise that lines its long coast to its mysterious and little known underwater world. From the depths of its pristine rainforest to the stark beauty of its high sierra. And as nearly half of all Peruvians are of native descent, they'll look at how these traditional peoples are balancing their age-old customs and beliefs with the mounting pressures of modern life. Nearly three quarters of Peru is covered by tropical rainforest. And the best starting point for an exploration of this vast sea of green is Puerto Maldonado, the gateway to the Peruvian Amazon. It's a town straddling two worlds, a modern day version of a Wild West boom town. Puerto Maldonado is our starting point of this expedition. It's also the place where we are going to meet Stefan Austermüller. He's a German biologist who lives in Peru, and he will be our guide for the next two months. Since the early 1970s and the discovery of gold, Puerto Maldonado has become one of the fastest growing towns in Peru, a base used by loggers and miners to exploit the natural resources of Peru's vast Amazonian lowlands. Finally we're off. All the months of preparations have paid off and I, I start to feel, as always, with expeditions like this, the excitement. And I'm happy to leave the noise and the bustle of the town behind. Eight hours downstream lies one of the last truly wild places on Earth, the Pampas de Rio Heath, an area of lowland rainforest, lakes and swamps beside the Heath River on Peru's eastern border with Bolivia. To help them unlock some of the mysteries here, Dos has enlisted the help of Dario, a remarkable man who can read the forest like a book. One thing about Dario fascinates me more than anything. He's known as the animal caller because of his ability to communicate with the wild. A special gift that I hope will bring us closer to the creatures of the forest.
totally surprised to see people again here in the middle of nowhere. And we wonder what these people are doing. But Stefan explains to us that these are gold miners and they are dredging the river bottom for gold. The problem is that they are polluting the environment because they use a very primitive method of getting out the gold by using mercury. And mercury, of course, is very, very toxic. And all this mercury, it comes in the river, in the air, it pollutes and poisons the plants, the animals, and even the people. Of course, there is a big problem. This gold hunting is these people's only source of income. So they are not very much interested in the environment, they're only interested in making money. It's the only way they can survive. With the town now more than six hours away, the last vestiges of civilization are gone, and wildlife becomes more common. First, capybara. Weighing in at up to 60 kilograms, they're the largest rodents on Earth. Then a brown agouti, followed by a hungry caiman. It's the agouti's lucky day. He's managed not only to escape the caiman, but dos as well. Finally, we're there. I can't wait to meet our man of the forest, Dario. His newly renovated home will serve as our base camp for the following week's explorations. But before exploring the jungle proper, the Rio wants to introduce us to one of his house pets. It's a young tarantula. This beautiful creature relies on speed to capture its prey, mostly insects. But once fully grown, it'll go for frogs or even bats and small birds. Dario assures us that humans are not on the menu and its bite is actually no more dangerous than a wasp sting. And it will be a little while before this one grows up. Amazingly, they can live for up to 30 years. <laughs> and we found a lot more in Dario's banana patch to keep a photographer happy. For their first trip into the forest, Dario is keen to show them something special. His calls trigger an almost immediate response from bands of monkeys. Eventually, a group of brown capuchin gets really close. Considered the most intelligent of the New World monkeys, the capuchin gets its name from the patch of black hair on the top of its head, which looks like a capuche or a monk's hood. I'm intrigued by what is drawing them to us. Are they just curious? Or is something specific being communicated here? For years, 
I've wanted to photograph the giant macaw in its natural habitat. And this is the place to do it. But to get close enough to get the perfect picture, we have to build a height, a shelter, to shield ourselves and the cameras from the birds. Dario wants to collect palm reed on the Bolivian side of the river. Its sturdy stems and broad fan-shaped leaves make it a perfect building material for a shelter. Dario knows an ideal place to build a hide. A so-called clay lick, which acts as an incredible attraction to forest animals and birds. Is that the lick over there where the holes are? Incredibly, it was only a few years ago that Western biologists learnt how important these clay outcrops are to the overall health of the forest. Clay is a vital but mysterious part of the diet of many animals and birds here. They use it to neutralize and detoxify themselves from the plant poisons they take up in their diet. Now we have to decide where we are going to build our heights. It seems that some of the best places are already taken. He's never done this before, but Dario wants them to build a hide just six meters away from the clay wall. This will allow them to get really close to the birds. Okay, Betty, do you want to start here, in this hide? For the insects at least, it looks as though Femke is as tasty as the clay. But the big question for me is, even with a hide like this, will the macaws tolerate our presence here? <laughs> you like it? <laughs> now we have a great view at the clay lake, and all we need is birds. But for those, we have to wait till dawn tomorrow, and hope that they will return. Meanwhile, Dario is determined not to give them a moment's rest. They follow him on a long hike into the forest, away from the river, towards an inland lagoon where he promises them something special. At the same time each day, Tarikayas, a kind of freshwater turtle, climb onto a log to sunbathe. To my delight, Butterflies are dancing around their heads. They are attracted by the minerals secreted from their tear glands. Dario tells us to be as quiet as possible. Just the slightest sound will chase them back into the water. Then Dario really puts his skills to the test. This call is for the giant river otter, a shy and increasingly rare forest predator. Because of pollution and overfishing, only 75 pairs are thought to survive in these forests, an area the size of the Netherlands. Dario's calls are creating an extraordinary response in the otters. He's actually provoking them by imitating the sound of an intruding male otter. The response is so immediate and aggressive. Obviously they are very territorial animals and clearly upset by Dario's sounds.
When the rio stops, they relax and start to feed. Now's the best moment to take pictures. An adult needs to eat four kilograms of fish a day. No wonder they call it the river wolf. It was this skill in animal calling that made Dario such a good hunter. Now working for the National Park Service, he's turned his talent to conservation out of concern for the rapidly depleting numbers. For 30 million years, the giant otter has lived and played in these waters. Though seriously threatened, with the likes of Dario on their side, they once again have a future. Still an hour and a half before sunrise, and we're on our way to the clay lake. I really hope the macaws are feeling a little bit more up to it than I do right now. It's always a rush in the dark to get everything set up in the height before the first birds arrive around daybreak. After that, Dario makes clear to us that any sound or any movement will chase the birds away and they won't come back for the rest of the day. Exactly as Dario had predicted, at 6 o'clock sharp, the first birds arrive. It's really incredible. It's the Heelys and the blue-headed parrots. By now, the ants are getting to our breakfast. We don't dare to touch it. Even the sound of a breaking cheese cracker will be enough to scare the birds off. Finally, the heelys and the blue-headed parrots come onto the clay wall. But still no sign of the macaws. Are they really smart enough to sense our presence? Or is it just that they don't come to the lake every day? The spectacular diversity of the Peruvian Amazon is shown off to its best in its butterflies. More than 3,700 species are thought to exist in Peru, more than any other country on Earth. And more than half of these species are found here, in the department of Madre de Dios. But to fully appreciate the diversity in these forests, you need to come here after dark. Tonight, Dario is taking us to a lake, which lies about a mile in from the river where we hope to find and photograph Cayman. But for that, we need a boat. And this dugout weighs hundreds of kilos. When we stop for a rest, a whole new world comes to life. A cacophony of sounds, much more than you hear in the daytime. I hear frogs and insects and birds and I really wish I knew which animal makes which sound. For me it's like making a night dive on a coral reef. You see totally different animals during the night and during the day. It's very very interesting. Now it's time to go in search of Cayman. It won't be easy to find one though, as they've almost been hunted to extinction for their skin.
Then, suddenly, out of the inky blackness, there he is. One of the older survivors of the rainforest, with an ancestral line taking him back to the time of the dinosaurs. Hanging in our torchlight, as if frozen in time. Every morning we go back to the clay lake to set up in the hide. But there are still no macaws on the clay wall. But we see them everywhere, in the treetops, but they don't come down. Actually, I begin to worry that they might be getting ill from the lack of minerals. The birds seem to be playing a game with us. This is so frustrating, I'll tell you. The hides are too close. They're really too close. They know that we are there, they see us, they smell us, they hear us even if we breathe. It's not good. Not even one animal came to the clay lake. Yeah. They know that we are here. It's as simple as that. We are too close. We're also too many. My plan is to return for the last time tomorrow and then just Femke and me. This is our very last shot at getting the photos of the macaws. To maximize our chances, I've decided no TV crew, no food, no water. We'll give it one final effort. Femke will film and I'll take the pictures. Fantastic! Six days of aching muscles, insect bites, heat and frustration. But all the effort was more than worth it. Yes! <laughs> so we did it! <laughs> Now that Dario is no longer hunting jaguar or giant otter, he sees their protection as something which can earn him a living in the future. His dream is to bring visitors into this forest to help them unlock some of its mysteries. I feel I've only just scratched the surface of this extraordinary man. Dario truly reads the forest like a book and all that knowledge is locked up in his head. Perhaps our best hope for saving wild places like these is through partnerships with its traditional people. People like Dario.